We're going to read from uh, Proverbs chapter 31, starting in verse 10 all the way through the end. Proverbs 31, 10 through, all, through the end. It's titled Epilogue, The Wife of Noble Character. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wood and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed, and she is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction on her t is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Welcome to Connecticut Winter Wonderland. I'm glad you're here. And like Jim said, I'm thankful for my snowblower. And so, and for the help, uh, Armando got here and helped me with the sidewalks. That was good. Appreciate that. Good to have John here. John's from the St. Louis area, and he's up here uh, uh, working for a few weeks. And so he heard about the Waterbury Church, and so he's our brother in Christ from Missouri. So good to have you, John, and so thanks for filling in on some of the songs. Um, I've been doing an app for that series out of the book of Proverbs, and um, uh, app stands for application, and, and that's, it, it really doesn't mean anything unless you apply it, and we should not look at the Bible as a textbook. It, it's not a textbook just to be studied. It doesn't mean anything. God has recorded this to transform us. And to make us better. And so uh, we're looking at different themes in the book of Proverbs. And this is obviously uh, an interesting one because he ends the book with an application for moms. And um, every time I do a lesson, though, usually on motherhood, um, there's usually a comment or somebody says something about how difficult it was to hear. And because a lot of reasons that... Motherhood is a difficult thing, okay? Um, it, it begins with a thing called labor. That should tell you something, right? And, and it gets all, goes on from there. But uh, I know Julie and I, for years, uh, we wanted to have children and couldn't have children. And so uh, we were married, I think, seven years before we adopted Jason. And, uh, and so we were, we were trying to start a family before that, but, you know, some couples struggle. They're not able to. And we were one of those couples. We tried to have children, couldn't have children. And, and not only that, but when we, she did conceive, we had several miscarriages. And some of you ladies understand what that's like, you know, and, and the pain that goes along with losing a child. 
And uh, in fact, uh, Jeremy had a twin, and uh, we lost a twin 10 weeks into the pregnancy. And so, very difficult. And so, motherhood is a, a challenge. And, and, and some of you are single. Um, and anytime we do messages on marriage, it's, it's get difficult in family because you're looking for somebody and you haven't found that person yet or that person hasn't found you. And you really would like to have a companion, but you don't have a companion. And so uh, that makes it difficult. And another thing, um, sometimes mothers are not too motherly. And we live in a cursed planet. And, and some of you have grown up in homes where you would wish it was better, but it wasn't. And, and maybe even moms can be MIA, missing in action. And where are they? We don't know where they are. And, and that's, that makes it difficult for some people because uh, of that. And, and then some of us become parents thinking that our families are going to be this or that, and they're not. And uh, you could have a prodigal. And some of you have prodigals. And it's a pit in your stomach uh, whenever you have that prodigal child. And, and uh, um, so there's, this is consistent with scripture, by the way. The, the things that I've just said, you can find these kind of scenarios in the Bible as well. For example, Ruth in the Old Testament. Um, she was widowed and also wanted to have children and could not. You have that story. You have women like Sarah and Hannah who had infertility problems. Uh, those women wanted to have children, had difficulty conceiving. Uh, how about Eve? How about her son Cain and Abel? That From the get-go, the Bible talks about a family that's dysfunctional. In Genesis chapter 4, a brother kills his, his brother. And imagine how the mother felt having, having that kind of domestic violence going on within the family and, and how much grief that would create for her. The Bible tells us that, that families are not always right. There's dysfunction within families. Um, and not only that, you know, this thing of parenthood and having a family, it's exhausting. Um, we just had uh, Julie's sister and, and her husband and their three kids with us for a few days back during Thanksgiving. And I told Julie, man, I forgot what it was like. There was crumbs all over the floor, you know. And, and I told Trisha that. And she said, welcome to my world, you know. And, and so, uh, and, and I'm not even caring for those three kids. Uh, I'm a bystander pretty much, but I got exhausted just watching them taking care of them, you know. Um, and I told you the story, one got lost in the neighborhood, and, and so we're out in the neighborhood of Nagatuck trying to find this 10-year-old, you know, and, and, uh, and so it was exhausting in a way, and, and so it reminded me of how much work it takes to raise a child, and so, um, and not only that, when you read Proverbs 31, ladies, um, that's a challenge, isn't it? I mean, you're saying, man, I'm tired already, and I've got to read this? That this, is an, uh, this woman is kind of a mixture between uh, Oprah and Martha Stewart, right? Uh, she's kind of this, this superwoman uh, that you read about in this text, and, and she's all kind of blended together. And, and so some women read this, and, and they're, they're exhausted by looking at this woman. Uh, remember, though, this is a proverb. It's a genre of literature. Um, I don't think it was, should be read as a checklist. I, uh, like some men read this and say, okay, wife, this is what I want. And you start checking it off, all right? Check. You're, no, you're not, you don't get a check there. Um, down here, no, you don't get a check there either. No, that's not what this is, this is like. This is more like a Mother's Day card. That, you know, whenever you get a Mother's Day card, it, it's, it's talking about some strong attributes that we see in you. It's like a bouquet of flowers. And that's the way you should look at this text, not as a checklist or a memo saying, okay, here's your job description, all right? But it's poetry saying, this is what we honor and esteem in a godly woman. So it's a model to follow. 
and, and I think it's a very good one. A little bit of background. Uh, I want you to know that Solomon didn't write this. Um, in chapter one, chapter 31, verse 1, it says, The sayings of Kim, King Lemuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, the son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer of, to my prayers. It, it was written by King Lemuel, whoever he is. We don't know who he is. All right, but it wasn't Solomon. But notice it was inspired by who? His mother. Proverbs 31 is a woman talking to her son about this is what you need to look for in a wife. I like that. And, you know, I overlooked that for a long time. But it, it's, it was inspired by King Lemuel's mother to write this. And she's saying, here, son, here are some things as you look for a husband here or a wife, you are, here is what you're supposed to be looking for. And so it's a Jewish mother teaching her son a poem. Another thing that we miss in English, that in Hebrew, if we were able to read out the Hebrew text, it's using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's an acrostic. It uses the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and then it develops a sentence. So in Hebrew, it's an acrostic with 22 verses, which is kind of cool. That, that's a Mother's Day idea. Whenever May comes along and you get the Mother's Day, use the 26 letters of the, of the English alphabet and stay with A, A and say, well, that maybe you have a wonderful attitude, but make it positive. Don't make it negative. Don't say uh, C stands for cat that you ran over when I was a little boy. Don't do that, <laughs> all right? Uh, make it positive, but use the 26 letters of the English alphabet and, and uh, develop a Mother's Day card uh, for your... Here we have the Hebrew alphabet and 22 verses, and it's cool that it's written in acrostic. You don't know that because of our English translation, but in, if we we're reading out of Hebrew, it's actually following the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters, and developing these wonderful things. So what do I see here are pearls of things that we need to look for um, in a godly woman. Look at verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find, she is far worth far more than rubies. And so um, there are some rubies, pearls, if you will, uh, that I think we get out of this text that we need to look at. And, you know, it, concerning pearls, there are imitation pearls out there. There are false ideas about what it means to be a woman. Uh, go to a, a supermarket checkout line and check out the magazines, all right? Uh, what are the magazines? Some are like Cosmopolitan, right? Um, there are other magazines for teens, for our teens, our young people. And, and, and I, one book I, of my magazine had the word self. You ever see that one? Self. And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, the world is telling me one thing. This is what a woman needs to look at, cosmopolitan, self, etc. Now, the book of Proverbs is telling me something else. So what I want to do is compare what the book of Proverbs says with Cosmo Woman, all right? As I look at those articles, uh, whether it's Kim Kardashian or whoever, it seems like the emphasis is on beauty, outward beauty, right? And there's, I mean, there's an obsession over outward beauty in our culture. And, and, and sometimes it's fueled by, you know, what's said in the culture. But Proverbs says, value spiritual depth over physical beauty. That that's, that's what the proverb, here you have a pearl here, that one pearl is to value spiritual depth over physical beauty. You know the cosmetic industry? is a $7 billion industry. And they say that it's one industry that's recession-proof. That it really doesn't matter what's going on with the, with the dollars and cents, people will still buy their makeup. Now, I'm not against makeup. Uh, you know, uh, my parents are from Kentucky. Uh, there was a Kentucky proverb that says, even an old barn looks better with paint on it. You know? And so... So there's, that's a good Kentucky proverb. And so, you know, I'm not against makeup. 
But I'm against valuing a person based upon just outward appearance. And the book of Proverbs is saying that's not where value is. We need to place spiritual depth over physical beauty. Look at this text, verse 30. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is what, ladies? Fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Beauty is fleeting. You know what he's saying? Another way of expressing that? It's a de depreciating value. A depreciating value. We don't usually like that. Like if you buy a car, as soon as you buy the car, what happens to it? It becomes a depreciating product, right? And here it says that, that beauty is also a depreciating value. You can't hold on to it. Amen. That eventually it will go away. And that's true of us guys and, you know, our, our virility. And ladies, it's true of also the outward beauty is that changes over time. The Bible speaks of that. Also, it says that beauty is deceptive. Charm is deceptive. It's saying that, you know, our world is basically saying, follow, you know, Miley Cyrus or Kim Kardashian, right? That emphasize the outward, right? What does Kim Kardashian do anyway? You know, she's not very articulate or anything. What is it all about, right? It's about appearance, isn't it? The outward show of this person. And sometimes that's very deceptive because we put so much emphasis there that we think that they're all so beautiful on the inside. But is that necessarily true? No. Charm is deceptive. Look at what Peter says. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles or the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of an inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So where does God put value? On the outward appearance? Not at all. God puts value on your heart. That that is what is important to our creator. Not the outward, but the inward. I came across this poem called The Beauty of a Woman. The beauty of a woman is not in the clothes she wears, the figure that she carries, or the way she combs her hair. The beauty of a woman must be seen in her eyes, because that is the doorway to her heart, the place where love resides. The beauty of a woman is not with a facial mole, but true beauty in a woman is reflected in her soul. It is the caring that she lovingly gives, the passion that she shows, and the beauty of a woman with passing years only grows. That's kind of what Peter is saying. That's what Solomon is saying here is that charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But what does he say? A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. It's interesting that this text does say a little bit about her appearance. Verse 22 she makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. It's interesting. It doesn't say that she needs to be dressed in all black. But that's about all it says about her outward appearance. But it says, emphasizes more the inner character of the woman. Verse 25, it says, she is clothed with strength and dignity. I like this part. She can laugh in the days to come. Ladies, I want you to know that you guys are the thermostats of your home. That you, you guys really control the temperature of the home. You know, Kentucky's got its proverbs. I've heard one since I've been in New England. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Yeah. I, I didn't hear that one until I came to New England. I heard about the barn down here in Kentucky. But here in New England, if mama ain't happy, nobody. What is that saying? Women, you guys are the thermostats, right? That if you are joyful and peaceful, what a blessing it is to the home. But Solomon will say, if you're complaining, it's better to live on the roof. All right. Uh, you know, and then he says that, that it's just going to drain the home. 
if you're critical and don't have a joyful spirit. But I like this woman. She's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh. Can any of you remember your mom's laughing? Oh, my goodness. I love to hear my mom laugh. She's 89 years old. And when my mom laughs, that's just precious, all right, to hear her laugh. And so uh, a mother that is joyful and optimistic is a great blessing to a home. And that, and that becomes a, a wonderful thermostat to set the temperature, the atmosphere of that home. Another thing that this text says, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tr tongue. She's not just eye candy, but it's somebody that has good instruction. And all, I get the idea that she can be trusted, that she is faithful, it says. And what a blessing it is to have a faithful woman in the home. Here's another value. Value the fear of the Lord over the praise of people. Um, the last part of verse 30 a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Who is her audience? Her audience is God. She has the audience of one. And that's what's motivating this particular person. How about us? You know? Often, it, you know, I, I do it too. Sometimes I start this comparing game. Any of you ever do the comparing game? Men and women are different in how we compare. Women, I, I, I understand that when you look at another woman, that it's common for a woman to look at the strong attributes they see in another woman. They may look at a woman and say, oh, she's so organized. I wish I could be organized. Or, or she is so disciplined. I wish I could be disciplined. You know? And you look at the strengths that you see in this person, and you try to just compare yourself to the strengths of that person. Men, we look at men... But usually men want to look at the flaws, the weaknesses of other men. And we say, well, I'm better than that. All right? And women will get, you know, they'll have a worse self-esteem and men will get proud. Okay? Whenever we do this comparing things. And so uh, there's con confusion here. And so the text is saying, look, look to pre please God. Everyone in this room, that, we, that should be our audience. That it shouldn't be, what, is other, what do other people think about me? But I need to praise and serve God. And this woman was that kind of woman. Another pearl, value serving others over serving self. All through this text, you read a woman, read about a woman who is an industrious, hardworking person. In uh, verse 31, it says, She gets up while it is still night and provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. So this woman, now remember, this was written when there was no electricity. All right? The, uh, when, when Proverbs was written originally, there was no electricity, okay? And so people got up a lot earlier and they went to bed a lot earlier. And so, but still, this is talking about a woman. If you look through the text, she's an economist, she's an investor, she's a planner, she, she's an administrator. And so, and I, I thought this text was appropriate for today. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. So it's a woman, you know, who takes care of her family. And verse 16, she considers a field and buys it out of her earnings and plants a vineyard. Now, a contemporary way of, of saying that is that she finds something on Craigslist and then sells it on eBay, you know, for profit, all right? But you've got a hardworking, industrious woman here. And then verse 11, going back to this idea of trust, I think, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. This is a trustworthy woman. What a blessing. You know, if my wife goes to the mall and she comes back with her arms full of bags of clothing or whatever, one thing about Julie, I don't worry about, uh, did she go overboard? Um, I don't worry about, did she spend more than she needed to spend? I really don't. In fact, she finds bargains better than I do. All right? 
I'll look at something and say, that's good, you know. And she'll, she'll come back, and if she saves a whole bunch of money, she, that's a good day, all right? That I don't have to worry about that. And, you know, when I, my boys were small, I didn't have to worry about would they be cared for. You know what I'm saying? I knew they were in good hands. Right, Jason? That, that, that their mother would take care of them, okay? She could be trusted. And, and so, um, now, if Julie got sick and was laid up for two or three days, look out. The home was a mess, right? And, and so, God help us whenever she was sick, you know, and it was just me and the boys at home, all right? But this woman, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Another attribute you see of this woman is what you see in verse 20. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. This woman is to be praised because she's concerned about other people. It wasn't just about self, right? That's what the magazine is, about self. I don't see that here. That this woman is a woman of noble character because she opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the, to the needy. So, so folks, what are we talking about? Well, there's two gospels preached today. One is cosmopolitan woman, Kim Kardashian, that kind of thing. And the other one is Proverbs 31. Now, which one are you going to follow? You know, are you going to follow our culture and really emphasize that the big deal is outward beauty? You know, or are we going to listen to our creator and say this woman is of noble nobility? This is what is to be praised. These virtues and not the other. How about what else can we compare? Ourselves? We got the housewives shows. Have you ever noticed that? The housewives of Orange County, the housewives of Atlanta. What's that all about, right? It's about self, isn't it? It's about beauty, right? It is not about what we're reading about in this text at all. There's two different gospels being preached. Which one are we going to follow? And truth be told, as we look at these texts, we all fail. No one can measure up to all of these examples. I don't. And I'm sure you guys will say the same, is that I can't, I can't match this. But at the same time, we come to Jesus and it says that Jesus is the ultimate example of sacrifice. And that he died on the cross so that we won't have to be perfect. He says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. I don't want you to walk out of here feeling burdened today, ladies. Of what we are is holding up a standard that God does honor. But also we need to hold up Jesus as the greatest example of sacrifice and follow him. If you're not a child of God, you have an opportunity to, to obey the gospel today. Some of you are studying, being studied with and you've, you've heard what you need to do. And So if you feel a burden to accept Christ today, you can. And, um, but at the same time, we learn from this text uh, the things that God esteems in the individual. And let's read the text and apply those virtues and find out what uh, true nobility is like. Let's stand and sing. Turn to 722. <clears throat> Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, all his 